Okay, but this is what it's about. What does it mean to say that there's a clear cost? Can we move our torture up to uh, the next slide? <laughs> what does it mean to say there's a clear and bright line between two kinds of concepts or behavior? Or what does it mean to say, on the other hand, this is the opposite question, that there's a fuzzy boundary between two kinds of behavior? And what the particular puzzle I'm interested in are these two facts that have that seem to be generally accepted. Some are some are contested, but but basically that, a, that there's a nuclear taboo. And this was the subject of Schelling's Nobel lecture, that a taboo, fortunately in his view, has grown up against the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, originally, they were as available for use in the American ice as any other weapons of war, simply more powerful. But by Lyndon Johnston's time, it would be Lyndon Johnston's time would be unthinkable to use these weapons, or at least uh, a decision of the highest order. And uh, on the other hand, many nations have sought nuclear weapons for the sake of prestige. And this is a puzzle to me. Uh, the, the way I, I put it sometimes is that think of a, a, a society that um, has a strong taboo against cannibalism, and yet they acquire pots and they make plans, they trade recipes of, of, of the, best, <laughs> the best things to do. And so there's, a, there's sort of a conflict here, and I'm trying to uh, resolve it. And, and here's the, my basic explanation, that it's got to do with clear lines, that prestige requires a clear line between achieving something and not achieving it. I'll define prestige. And the taboo requires a clear line between complying and violating, and also define taboo as a certain kind of norm. Very, I'm sorry, how many of these prestige seekers got these things before the taboo developed? Well, I think that um, some of them got it, and some of them kept seeking it. I mean, a good, a good example of somebody who, who kept seeking it was Saddam. Uh, I think North Korea is interested in it for prestige. I would say Iran for is okay. significantly okay. interested in it for prestige. No, but sir, I, I, that's a good question. But I think, for example, China is somebody who got it after the taboo developed. But you could say, well, it was, the taboo wasn't there. But I'm talking more about, I think, I see your point, and I'm talking more about modern, modern times. So, so the, the, the very clear line between a nuclear and a non-nuclear explosion, the fact that it's based on physically different principles, allows both prestige, this is my argument, but allows both prestige for possession and a taboo against use. So there is this very fine line between these two kinds of, uh, uh, of your relationship to nuclear weapons. And that's the argument I'm going to make. And so I'll, I'll start off by talking about vagueness in general, and uh, vagueness in different kinds of speech acts. And so we were talking yesterday about the, the, the 1973 war, and here's, here's uh, Brezhnev saying it straight to Nixon. If you don't act jointly with us, we will assess it have been necessarily urgently to consider the question of taking steps unilaterally. He's going to take steps, and of course the steps are just sending send the, send the, 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 the forces. And uh, Nixon really lets Brezhnev have it uh, from the shoulder. Such an action would produce incalculable consequences, which would be in the interest of neither of our countries. And, and I guess there's a reason to keep your threats vague. Threats cause people to respond, there's a certain reactance against a threat. You don't want to name what you're going to do. I mean, there's other reasons not to name it, uh, in case you want to, well, I'm not sure if that's a good reason. You might say, well, one reason you, might, you don't want to name it, what you're going to do in a threat, is because you'll lose credibility if you don't actually do it. But then what's the point of a threat but to bind your hands, to, to, to convince the other person you are actually going to do it? I can see the, uh, the say, uh, say, don't make your threat specific for fear of of the person reacting against it, uh, making it too vivid what you're going to do to him. I don't see the argument based on, on maintaining your reputation, because that seems to, in my mind, to go against the very purpose of a threat. But threats, in fact, as these examples show, they, in fact, are often vague. Vagueness in promises or agreements. And this is a famous vague promise that the no, nuclear states made to the non-nuclear states as part of the non uh, the non-proliferation treaty to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the cessation of the nuclear arms race, and it's caused a lot of difficulties. That the, the non-nuclear powers took this a lot more seriously than the nuclear ones seem to have, have taken it. But I suppose if you tried to make the agreement precise, here's what we're going to do, it wouldn't have been achievable. So the technique of, st of leaving th things 
vague in agreements is, a, is an important and necessary one. Vagueness in promises uh, which, which, that come out of apologies. Now, I was assured that Janet, Janet Phelps is no relation, so I'm going to go ahead and, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and use this. Well, there he is, uh, Michael Phelps, uh, you know, indulging in his bong, and uh, he got caught by the news of the world that appeared on the front page. And he says he's sorry he acted in this youthful and inappropriate manner. Uh, I promised my fans in public. I promised my fans in public it will not happen again. And you mean I won't uh, get caught or I won't be, <laughs> do anything youthful or, or inappropriate? I mean, it's a ridiculous idea. I'm never going to do anything inappropriate for the, as long as I live. And so, so people do expect a promise as part of an apology. But it's not like you whip out a legal contract and sign it with the other person. If, if, you, if you tried to make your promise really specific, you'd start fighting over uh, what, the, what, the, what the promise component ought to be. You'd never get the apology out and accepted. So I'm interested, in, you know, those are different kinds of speech acts, promises and, and agreements and so on. I'm, I'm in threats. I'm interested in directives, another kind of speech act the basis of a taboo, norms and taboos, and of course one important aspect of uh, a vagueness in, in a taboo or a norm is the slippery slope. Uh, just the other, I can't tell you what it was about, but just the other day in the faculty meeting somebody made this classic slippery slope argument, we can't do this or, I'll, or else this will happen and this will happen and then we'll end, we'll end up doing this thing, you see. And, and so this is a very, very common type of argument, and sometimes it's valid and sometimes it isn't, but it's always worth clarifying. I mean, the, the argument uh, that various people have made against gay marriage, like Justice Scalia, made an argument somewhat like this, that if we allow this, next will be uh, polygamy, incest, and bestiality. Now, <laughs> to me, this is not that slippery a slope. I mean, I, 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 I do see a, 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 you know, certain gaps in the continuum between one and the other, but, but it's, a very, it's, a very common, it's a very common form of argument that is, gets made in various contexts, okay? And the vagueness in assertives, and I, I, I stuck this in just when I saw the, 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 the title of your talk, okay? We do not torture. What do you mean by that? Well, maybe we can replace this this fuzzy concept of torture by we shall not do anything that's not allowed in the U.S. Army Field Manual. I mean, attempting to, 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 to draw a line where before there was none in order to sl stop slippage across the line. Very, it's, really, that goes up, up, that sort of straddles directives and assertives. But the particular aspect I'm interested in in vagueness and assertives is vagueness in claims of supporting prestige. You know, the fact that I just exploded a nuclear weapon, that's fairly not vague. I mean, that's to, to, relative to, to vague and precise statements, that's a fairly precise statement. Uh, I, my, my people are happy and I run a democratic country. That is vague. And so that my claim will be that the first kind of statement can support prestige, but the second kind doesn't. And I'm going to give arguments for that. I don't want to carry on. Is, is there anything, any comments or questions or clarification or even otherwise? Is that all right? Okay. So I have to define prestige. And the party has prestige within a group. I'm going to define it at the second level of beliefs. A party has prestige within a group for a certain quality if the members of the group believe that they generally, each other, believe that the party has the quality. They believe that also that they generally see the quality as desirable. And the third element is they believe on account of these last two that the party holds power in the group. Prestige must give you power. It must be some, for something that your group sees as desirable, maybe not morally desirable, but maybe I wish I had it uh, too. And, but the important thing is that is this, it's a second order belief. You might talk about somebody having the quality as a zeroth order belief then if everyone thinks you're good, that's reputation. If everyone thinks that everyone thinks you're good, that's prestige, you see? So, so maybe in some school people are wandering around saying, you know, everyone thinks this is a great school, but I'm not having a good time at all. There's a school with prestige, but low reputation. 
or if they were saying the opposite, you know, people don't really appreciate this place. And everyone says that. I think it's great, but nobody appreciates it. In that case, they'd be all wrong, but it would have, uh, what would it have? It would have reputation without prestige, okay? So there is a difference, and I wanted to find prestige up at that second level. Okay, just stress so, it. So, just to clarify, this is now defined probabilistically, sort of there are degrees of belief on that, or is it Yeah, I'm going to, you'll see it. That, well, I, I haven't, I, I, I've tried to find it kind of dichotomously, but it's a, it's a simple step. There's various elements in it. You know, how much power do people, does it give you, and, and how desirable is it? I'm going to focus on the first part. I'm going to focus on the belief part. Is it really a second sort of order belief? Because you include this word generally, which means that people believe that other people have this belief because they think that other, doesn't it you know, go backwards? Or? You mean, couldn't it be third or fourth or fifth or something like that? Or, yeah. Uh, I, in order, and this, this is related to this. In order to be able to assign a number to it, I'm going to stop at the second order. But I think, re as, I think reasonably, you know, if you're used to game theoretical kinds of thinking, I mean, I have, to, I try to, I have to, I like to relate this to, to political scientists. But generally, we'd say, yeah, why not go all the way up from third, second, right up to the top? But I'm going to, I'm just going to define it for the sake of assigning numbers as second order belief. So. Um, When you look at the, this is data, it doesn't look like data. Okay, this is data. This is me going into uh, newspaper databases or, or something like that, LexisNexis, and looking for attributions of prestige, looking in historical abstracts or times that the historians have attributed prestige to some action of a country. <coughs> and uh, I'll compare <coughs> individuals with a country. Now, this, is, this first isn't data. I shouldn't say that. This is just life, okay? When, when do we get prestige as an individual? We're in a select club, we're in a certain frat, we wear a certain pin, we, we were, were full professors, we were chair professors, we won the Nobel Prize and we went to Sweden, uh, we, we, drive a, <laughs> we, drive a, we drive a Cadillac or some business like that, some fancy car, we live in Beverly Hills, and fin I finished a marathon. The point is that all these are public, they're all for desired qualities, and they all have clear boundaries. There's no such thing as being, well, I guess there's a set, there is, there are semi professors, but there's, there's, there's three levels, each with its clear boundary, then there's a chair professor and so on. But still, there's no <laughs> continuum of professorship. Uh, but we don't get prestige from doing our job well and just living an honorable life. We may get respect, but According to my definition of prestige, we don't get prestige because people don't know that other people, it's not clear, well, we'll see why that's so. Okay? And for countries, this is data. For countries, if you have certain marked kinds of weapons, uh, many countries, uh, several countries, I think nine countries have aircraft carriers, even though many never leave the dock. But having an aircraft carrier is, is a clear line difference, a nuclear sub, colonies in the old days, Conquering Mount Everest, being first in time to achieve something discreet. Either you got up to the top or you didn't. Either you launched that satellite or you didn't. If it didn't get around the Earth, if it went like this, then that's not achieving it. Uh, having the tallest building, I mean, I've lost track, but every, a lot of people keep track of who's got the tallest building or the fastest train and, and so on. And again, conquering AIDS or corruption, literacy. What's, what's literacy? I mean, what, what do you have to do to be literate? And, it's a continuum. Is it 96% now or 97%? There's no clear boundary of importance that allows having a high literacy rate, unfortunately, to give you prestige, which is actually a, an issue. You know, how can we convert some of these other more socially useful achievements into <coughs> prestigious, into <laughs> prestige bearers? Okay, so now I've got a, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about what vagueness is in my concept, then I'm going to argue why prestige requires uh, clear lines. I, it shouldn't mean failing to be s fully specific. It's not saying where the boundaries of your concepts are. And uh, in philosophy, there's this, there's this tendency. It's not a tendency. It's everything. Anything I've seen in philosophy. It's a big issue in philosophy. But it's it's treated as semantics. It's treated as let's relate the word to to its innate meaning somehow and talk about the boundaries of the word. And as somebody who's more uh, 
tends to game theory. I want to see it as a kind of communication. I want to see it as what beliefs do I induce in you when I say something. If I induce certain kind of beliefs, then what I said was vague, and otherwise it was precise. Those are opposite, precise and vague. Yeah, in a certain way. I, well, I just remember that I remember I remember a particular occasion, and I'm pretty sure you got upset at me for using them as opposites. That's why I was asking you. <laughs> You really? Wanted. That's pretty vague. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe it's because I, 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 thought, I, I, mean, I thought I thought of it and I was upset because I, I didn't want you to scoop me on it. <laughs> well, but, so in, imprecise, imprecise and vague would not be synonyms. Imprecise and vague. Okay, you're right. I think you're right. I think I'll have to give in. On that. Well, Fortunately, I didn't, I, I didn't write it down, it's and between, except for this. It's, between, it's definitely between somewhere between A and B, yes. which is, in a sense, very precise. I mean, it's, uh, what is that? That's no, in fact, I think you're, ab not vague. you're absolutely right. In okay. fact, my first example shows okay. that. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a kind of a semantic approach to what vagueness is. Um, on the x-axis is wind speed, and on the y-axis is uh, various words, uh, not windy or degree of windiness, and up at the top there's windy. And so, so to go from the words meaning down to the, to the word, down to its meaning, you go up on the y-axis and go over to this rising curve and then go down and see what the wind speed is given somebody says it's windy, okay? And so I don't think this is vague. I mean, the curve starts flat, rises sharply until we get to windy and then flattens off again at windy. And the middle part is degree of windiness. And I don't think it's vague. A property that can hold to a degree is not vague. I mean, this, this has precise, not windy has a precise boundary uh, there's a precise value of windiness in between, and then the top is windy. I mean, if something is, if something is imprecise, if I say I'm thinking of a prime number, okay, I'm not being precise. I'm not saying exactly what number I'm thinking of, but I'm not being vague because the boundary of, of what counts as thinking of a prime number versus not thinking of a prime, some, think of some other number, that's that's well defined. And so I would say this is not a this is an approach that's been suggested, but it's not an appropriate one. And here's something that took me a while to make up this slide. It's a further extrapolation of this approach. And so the same diagram as before, wind speed on uh, horizontally and, and various words vertically, and this S-curve going, relating the two. And so you can see the top, I distinguish not windy from windy, okay? But then within windy, there's exclamation mark W means clearly windy. So if the wind speed is here, it's not only windy, it's clearly windy. <coughs> but if it's, if it's a little less windy than that, then it's windy, but it's not clearly windy. Aha, it may be windy and clearly windy, but is it clearly, clearly windy? <laughs> and so you've got this fractal of, of, uh, of terminology. And so this is very clever and everything. I, I, I forget, I better find the reference from the person who, who well, there are various references, actually, but, but basically it's the same problem as before. I mean, instead of one concept with a very clear boundary, windy or not, you've got this whole array of concepts, all with clear boundaries. So, so I, I don't think this is vague at all. This is, this is r repeatedly precise. Here's what I want to do. I'll make up this game. Formerly, I would call it a global game. Somebody's, somebody's saying something to somebody else, somebody else is believing something about what, they, what that person observed to have to say it. Observers indexed by x on a continuum 0 to 1, subject indexed by y. Oh my goodness, look at this TV, there's a computer screen. Uh, it, <laughs> it worked on my computer, okay, this is going to be interesting. Instead of a mu, this computer is, shows a little, a little computer screen. <laughs> The subject y possesses the quality to degree qy, identically distributed, normal computer screen, uh, with variant uh, with standard deviation one. If people are ignorant about mu, okay, we better start. We better stop. If people are completely, completely ignorant about mu. What does completely ignorant mean? We'll talk about that. Now, what they're, they're not What they're interested in? There's a special subject, and they're interested in that person's quality. Uh, as a step to prestige, okay? And so here's what they do. First, they calibrate their words. 
And then somebody who has information about that person's quality uses a, the word to describe the quality, uses the word high or low, high quality or low quality. And then they reassess. So in the calibration stage, observer X observes subject Y, corresponding subject Y, acquiring an estimate of mu, and thus an estimate of that subject's quality. I, I, I'm, I, I, by, by, by just sampling one person for this quality, I'm getting an estimate of where the population mean is. And so that's not a very good estimate of this other person's quality, because I haven't even looked at this other person. But it's something. It's better than complete ignorance. At least now I have one, based on one sample, I know where the population mean is. Ah, but here's an announcement. A certain special observer observes the subject's quality, but can't report it as a number because the language doesn't, isn't that fully developed. This person either makes a vague, a vague communication or a clear line, oh geez, or a clear line communication. Uh, they publicly announce low or high according to whether the quality is less than or equal to, which is shown as a pair of scissors, <laughs> or, or greater than or equal to this particular value. In other words, the, <laughs> it's, it's, what, is, what is this value? It's that, it's that special observer's estimate of the population. The special observer also looked and sampled the population. They have an idea of where the mean is. They say high if it's higher than the mean. They say low if it's lower than the mean. It seems like a sort of an efficient way to code your words and, and a sensible way to use the word high and low. That's one way the person's words acquire meaning. Another way is that there's some public line, there's some, there's some publicly known reference level of quality, and I'll use that. I won't use my observed my, my estimate. I'll say high if it's greater than this value, which we'll call zero, and we'll say low if it's less than the value. See? And I'm going to make this argument that when they reassess, when they reestimate the subject's quality, and also when they estimate others' estimates of that quality, this last calculation is relevant to prestige, I'm going to argue that this second clear line communication with the reference level is much more helpful to prestige and this is, doesn't do much for the person's prestige. If I say hi here, it doesn't do much. If I say hi here, it does a lot. Okay. So I wish, uh, I think I'll, I'm on my way to a, a general theorem, but right now I've only got an example, but I think it's a convincing example. Here is uh, the quality on the x-axis, and, and we have x is PDF for the population mean mu, and it's absolutely flat. It's a uniform distribution. It's an improper distribution. Uh, it's, it's uniform minus infinity to plus infinity. Then x observes a certain, uh, the quality of his, of, of, of his corresponding subject. And, and given the assumptions, he has a normal distribution centered on his observation. X then estimates what other people's estimates are, and that's also going to be a normal distribution, but with a wider variance. Okay, because there's the, the noise not only of maybe I'm wrong about the population mean, but even if I knew the population mean, I wouldn't be quite sure what that person, this other person observed. But there's all these other people uh, with noise on their observations. So my estimate of the population mean is less noisy than my estimate of your estimate of the population mean, because I have to, there's this other chancy step in it, okay? So first off, right now this is, this is uh, calibration. And uh, then I'll go on to a vague statement that the quality according to this special observer is higher than, higher than average. Uh, here's before. That was, that's a repeat of the last slide, these two normal distributions, one wider than the other. And here's after. If the person, the special observer, says it's high, then the mean of my estimate of the subject population moves up by the square root of pi. I mean, what's really happening is somebody just told me that, that this person is the higher of two samples. The person took two samples, and this person just told me that this special subject I'm interested in is the higher of the two. And so it's possible to calculate the, I don't think it's possible to express it analytically, but it's possible to do calculations about my posterior distribution given that message. And it turns out that the mean, the, the estimated, you know, the estimate of the 
mean of a normal law that's higher obtuse samples is pi to the minus one half greater than the your estimate of the original mean. Okay, so it did help. It did it did increase both the person's reputation and, and prestige. Now, I, those those two curves aren't that, but I'm just saying I'm just saying that as a fact. We'll calculate how much it increased that later. Now here's after a clear line announcement. This person now says the person is, the, the sub special subject is greater than zero. These two distributions simply get chopped off, cut off below the zero point. And so if I've shown here's quality zero and higher than that is, uh, is 0.5, which observer X happened to observe, the means, because their lower parts are cut off, the means move up from here up to here. Now why, I wonder why, uh, I think I've, um, that this diagram isn't quite right. That this, oh, you know, this, it, it, this, this should go through the top of this. There's no reason on earth why, why um, yeah, this, this, this is not quite right. I think that it's straight on what I was, when I was fiddling with it. In any case, the mean moves up from 0.5, in this case, to 1.2. That's my, that's, that's, that's my, my estimate of the population, my new estimate of the population mean. And my estimate of other people's estimates moves up even higher. It moves up to 1.76. And the fact that my estimate of the other people's estimates moves up higher is the important point here. It's because this red curve, this one which is my estimate of their estimates, has a longer tail. And it's because more of that tail gets chopped off that its mean moves up higher than, than this other simple, you know, my estimate of the population mean does. Okay. And so I've gotten, I've gotten various uh, calculations here. Uh, if if 1.76 is my estimate of the population mean, that's not the subject's prestige. The subject's prestige is, is that value over all the various people that made an observation of that subject. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the average of that value for every, po every, every person uh, who, who made all these different observations. But I can make the same argument I did for that one subject for every person, whether they observe high or low, the, 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 their, their estimate of others' estimates will move up more because it's broader and more of its uh, tail got chopped off um, when the person said he's, it's greater than zero than the other case. That's the, that's, uh, I hope, I, I, I gotta work on explaining that better, I think. But basically, that's the reason prestige increases more than reputation when someone says the subject is higher than some reference line, okay? Now, what is this like in game theory? I mean, what, 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 what past games are relevant to this? And I would say almost none. And the reason is that in game theory, we always assume a common language. We always assume that if people, if we have, a, say, a coordination game, and if we think we'll coordinate on the first, the upper left equilibrium, we know what the upper left equilibrium is, you see? You know, supposing some people were in space capsules and they had to do that, and you had no idea that the matrix you were seeing was, a, was presented to the other person in the same way, how would you coordinate? You couldn't. And it was, a, it was a very interesting paper, I think, by uh, Vincent Crawford and Hans Holler, with, where they took this on, and the way they made a sensible game out of it was to repeat the game with a discount factor. And so here's a, coordin a pure coordination game with ones on the diagonal and zeros off the diagonal. And their idea was that you know, just choose something, and if you coordinate by chance, stick with it. But if you don't coordinate by chance, uh, choose something at random again. And eventually, you'll lock on to coordination, see? I mean, somebody would say, choose something, and if, and if we don't coordinate, you choose, I'll, I'll, you, 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 you follow me next time. But you can't say that, because not only do the moves not have players, they're not distinguished, but neither do the players have, sorry, not only do the moves not have names, but the players don't have names. There's, there's no way to coordinate except on the basis of how this particular game is played. And eventually you'll get to uh, 
coordination on one of the equilibria or the other. And, you know, I, I made a little calculation, and the expected value <coughs> of this game for a discount rate of 0.5 mm -hmm. turns out to be one and a third. Okay? Eventually, you'll coordinate on the end, you'll get one and a third. Here's a three person version of it. So here's a three move version of it, three by three. This is easier to play than this one. The third one is easier to play than the second one. Can you see what you do in this case? You can guarantee coordination in two moves if you have three of the possible moves available, whereas you can't do that at all if you've only got two moves available. You choose a move if you're lucky that you stay there. If you're unlucky, then you go to the third one that neither of you chose. Okay? And so you're and so the expected value for that same discount rate for this game is 1.5. It's actually easier to play this game than it is to play this game. And of course you can keep on and ask questions how do you like go this. To the third one if the moves don't have radius? I mean, pardon? How do you go how do you know what the third move is that nobody chose if the moves don't have radius? Well, you know what the other guy you know what the other guy chose, uh, and and he knows what you chose. <laughs> In your own language. Yeah, in your own language. It's not like you're not informed of the other's choice. Uh, you know, you'll say he chose this and you chose that, so you don't get the one one. Well, in that case, I'll choose the one, I'll choose the the, the 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 move corresponding to the cell corresponding to the move that he didn't choose and I didn't choose. Well, um, imagine imagine giving this imagine. This could be completely scrambled. This three by three game could be completely scrambled. I learned after the first play that I chose this first roll and he chose the second column. That I, that I do know. Now he may have said, he may have thought he was, in his matrix, it may have been the third column that he was choosing. But I get translated into my, um, into my matrix, and so I'm able to identify the non chosen pair of moves. So this is a different strategy than the strategy. Yeah, yeah, you don't keep randomizing here. You can so, do better. Yeah, but now how do the players do the players have to coordinate on their strategy for each game? They do. They have to they have to they have to for, you know, they have to they have to uh, say, "Hey, I'm not going to keep choosing that same move I chose last time in hopes that he'll eventually find it. I'm going to choose." But I think that, that that's not asking the players any more than say the Nash equilibrium mass. And they're, they're as smart as Nash equilibrium players. They just don't have a common, you might say they don't have a common labeling scheme to, to apply the Nash equilibrium. So I think, you know, this is what we were talking about last night. It sounds relevant to your work, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you, you're still a little skeptical of it. Okay. Uh, how am I doing for time? You have about uh, 10 minutes. Okay. And then yeah. questions? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's no, no problem. Okay. So in this, in this scheme, having high quality and therefore deserving prestige and being windy are vague because the here doesn't know the borders of the announcer. And a clear line helps, according to this idea. So what is a clear line? In a sense, we're talking, we're talking something very close to what is the focal point. A clear line is a line, and I'm going to really say it shouldn't be called a line, it should be called a gap. In the common mental space, that becomes focal and therefore allows non vague communication. And so the next business is what is this business of a mental space? And, uh, you know, I'll turn to, uh, uh, you know, I'll whip up my copy of Foundations of Measurement to talk about that. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> what is this? Okay, somebody, somebody did this, right? This is a practical joke. Given an ordering, uh, which is a, sort of a squiggly, uh, squiggly greater than, of, a sti of stimulus pairs by similarity. Here's a typical problem of, of measure, Give, uh, proximity measure. Giving an order of stimulus pairs by similarity, find a metric on the delta, on the stimuli that represent it, that represents it. Find especially one with additive segments. If you talk about uh, B, B, B between, B, being between A and C, you want, in some defined sense, you want the distance between A and C to be the sum of those two distances. And it's, 
it's possible to have metrics that don't satisfy that, but most, most of the metrics that people have considered do satisfy it, and it's, it's a simple, meaningful way, meaningful constraint to put on your metric, okay? So typically there's, a, there's going to be a bunch of axioms on this similarity ordering on the basis that somehow this similarity ordering is somehow primitive and it's possible for people to, to make similarity judgments and our, our derived metric from that is our construct and we can ask them that, it's not asking too much, but what pattern must the similarity judgments display in order for us to have such a metric? And typically you're going to have a solvability axiom. I mean, you're going to have something saying that if, if, if this is, um, you know, a certain degree of uh, similarity to this, then there's, there's stuff between it that's of every intermediate degree of similarity. And that's exactly what doesn't happen if there's a line in the metal space. I mean, there's nothing that's, that's halfway between a nuclear and a non-nuclear weapon is basically what's, what this is saying. And so, uh, I would rather have it be a gap because, you know, to talk, call it a line is to invite a question about, you know, is a nuclear weapon on the line? Tell me, get, describe a weapon that's right on the line. And I say, I don't, I don't know what a weapon that's exactly on the line is, but if it's a gap, what's a weapon that's in the gap? Well, I just told you it's a gap. There's no weapon in the gap. Okay, so, so basically a better representation of this is not a line, but a gap in the metal space. And so the I haven't done this, this would be a future task, okay? The basic idea is that these axioms on the, that define metrics on metal spaces hold locally, but not for every, not globally. And they don't hold globally because maybe there's lines or maybe there's gaps in the space. Okay, uh, I, this, so this will be brief. <laughs> of course, if you want to ask a question about it. Uh, a behavior is socially taboo if it's specific, if it violates a strong social norm, if the norm has no clear relation to, to interests, I mean, don't go near that tree. Uh, why not? Because it's taboo, okay? The violation is relatively unthinkable. I mean, we don't weigh whether to, to do some of the horrible taboos I could mention. We just don't even think about them. And compliance comes from one's own shame or others revulsion or one's identity as a group member. Uh, it doesn't come from weighing, for example, of the social benefit to the group because maybe the norm has no clear relation to interests. This is my definition, and I'm willing to, I'm flexible on it. I'm willing to, I'll give up one of these, but not more than that. Well, we can. <laughs> so, so clear lines maintain taboos because both the complier and the enforcer must know when punishment is called for. They must know the line. I can't be surprised when you say you shouldn't have done that, okay? Enforcers must often know that other enforcers know the line. Often enforcing a taboo is, a, is, is very costly to an enforcer if the enforcer asks, uh, acts alone. But if other people share this view that it's enforcement time, great. And so, uh, but that does presume, if it's, especially if it's a strong norm, that means to be strongly enforced, we, we all must share a view of the line, okay? And there's other non-strategic considerations why, if there's not a clear line, that the norms kind of collapse. And, and there's an excellent book on the Challenger disaster where people said, we took this chance last time, and this is only a little bit riskier than what we did last time. And, well, we launched, now we've launched last time in this temperature, and let's, it's only a degree or two less, and so on. So there's other, there's other ways that a slippery slope can arise and undermine the norm. And so, again, I guess I'm repeating here what I said at the start. The nuclear norm is, is, is especially unstable. There's a, there's, there's a worry that it might be unstable. At least there's this one force for, towards instability because it says don't use nuclear weapons, but not don't possess them, or don't, don't even make plans for using them. These two things, it, it, really there's a fine line between these. There's another concept of line. There's a very fine line between you can have them, you can you know, make up a psyop, but good lord, don't ever use them. And so I would, I come to the end, I would say what's next is to you know, draw some implications of, of policy from it to see how people can reinforce the line between nuclear and non-nuclear. I mean, many countries are uh, apparently acquiring nuclear weapons and, uh, and they're maybe doing what's called hedging. They're getting 
you know, within a year of having nuclear weapons. Even though they don't have them, they don't test them, they, they're almost effectively nuclear powers because they, if things got hot, they could, uh, they could go ahead and either build them or assemble the parts. And so there's a, there's a, 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 a fuzzing of the line. And is it a threat or is it not a threat to, to the nuclear taboo and to nuclear, and to nuclear prestige? Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that, I think order, that Israel is one in order to have vagueness, but when there really isn't, or what, what's, what's the? I mean, so there's these two aspects: the prestige and the taboo. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Israel is not interested in the pre its prestige in nuclear weapons, yes. and any more than say South Africa is interested in the prestige when it built its nuclear weapons. I mean, they have these strategic plans that that are are, you know, I mean. I would say their goal is to is is deterrence of an attack, a full scale attack on their country, probably like South Africa's was. Or, uh, and so, I, I I don't think any of this applies to Israel. I mean, I, I think the taboo. Uh, in particular, the, the refusal to acknowledge, I guess, is, the, is that just sort of a, an epsilon of vagueness or something? I mean, it's it's is vagueness in some sense a, a slippery slope or? I think that there's a big, a, a big uh, step when a country tests its weapons, because you know I went back and looked at the headlines when China tested its, it tested its weapons, and even though everyone said that it's going to happen, it's going to happen, they were big, and so it was it was big when Korea did it, and, and wherever people are saying about Iran, if Iran does it, it'll be really really big. So it's it's and th again this is this is it's one thing for Israel, everyone know for no, for everyone to know that Israel has. But if Israel were to test, everyone would know that everyone knew. And that would cause some of these problems. Uh, I think this is a, is a supportive uh, comment of the essence of what you're saying, even though I want to quibble uh, one, one thing in particular. I don't think there is a nuclear taboo by your definition. And I don't even think it's very debatable. <coughs> when you go back and look at the work that uh, Richard Betts has done uh, on sort of early stages war and looking at the U.S. considerations on whether or not to use nuclear weapons, there's just, there's no, uh, they, they discuss lots and lots and lots, there's lots of discussion about whether they should use nuclear weapons, and it's all from the point of view of uh, would it be efficacious. They never, nobody ever says, you know, we shouldn't even be talking about this because uh, there's this taboo and that would be so horrible if we actually did it. They just, they talk about should we do it? Should we not do it? Is there going to be you know, uh, a nuclear cloud? Or you know, what are the what are the costs and benefits of using it? Jake, wait, I'm, I, I, okay, because okay. that's not really the point. Of, the main point. Of my, <laughs> okay. The main the, the main point I want to make is um, so I don't think there's a taboo as you've defined it because decision makers don't have this sort of first order preference for. Uh, you know, sort of like lexicographic or, you know, just absolute preference for not using it. Uh, but they certainly have a preference of some sort because if you said you can achieve your objectives, uh, you have a particular objective, you can achieve it with nuclear weapons or without nuclear weapons. Obviously, they would choose to do it uh, without nuclear weapons. Now, if you said you can do the same things, but the cost is a little bit higher. You know, maybe there are going to be another an extra hundred casualties if you do it uh, without nuclear weapons than with. I think very clearly they would still choose to do it without nuclear weapons. So there's a clear preference for using for not using nuclear weapons, but there's not a taboo as you define it. But what I think is interesting, and this is where I think this is a supportive comment to the sort of fundamental thing that you're saying is that what, what, what causes that preference? I think 
in a sense, it's this more a second order belief that uh, there's a, a taboo, if you will. So even though they can interrogate themselves and see immediately that there is no taboo as you defined it, there's a felt need for a clear line. And there's this idea that if there were a violation, then this kind of <coughs> higher order belief that maybe everybody has, which is useful, which leads to then a preference against actually using them, would somehow not be possible. So I wonder if, in this case, even though we don't have a taboo, we kind of have higher order, decision makers have higher order beliefs. They have beliefs about either the existence of a taboo, even though they don't feel it themselves, or you, you need another word for what it really is, but they have beliefs about uh, what other players believe and the importance of having a clear line to speak to the baby. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let uh, me. And that's uh, important. Uh, two things, okay. Uh, one is the premise that, that, that uh, Richard Betts talking about uh, people just said, should we do it or should we do it? Well, it's impractical. Nina Tannenwald is the person at Brown, I think, who's done the most work on the history of the nuclear taboo. And her thesis is that it developed. It certainly wasn't there at the start. Uh, Eisenhower, she's got various quotes of him saying, this is, this is just a weapon like others. And even at that point, it may have been wishful thinking. But over time, uh, it grew to be a, ta a taboo in her view. Now, people have contested that. I mean, you know, Kohane came to our university and, and, and talked about the, the social norms and international relations, and basically his view would be nonsense. There's no evidence, okay? I, 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 about, about, your def, about whether it's a taboo by your definition, a taboo is a social norm. It's not necessarily an individual norm. It, it, it's, by calling something a social norm, I mean it's kept in place by, at least by others' enforcement. Maybe it's also kept in place by your own conscience, but other conscience, but others are going to enforce violations and reward compliance. And so I've got uh, compliance comes from one's own shame, others' revulsion, and one's identity. You know, perhaps you're saying that you, in your view, uh, the United States would have been willing to use nuclear weapons in 2003 or in, in you know, two, uh, 1991 against Iraq if it, if it saved a few casualties. But they looked around the world and they say others would, would be revolted by this, and so they didn't. So that fits into my definition. The only thing I change, I think, in my definition is violation is relatively unthinkable. Maybe every person in Bush's cabinet thought about it, but the question is, did they discuss it? I, I've now changed that to is relatively un, undiscussable. And you know, you're talking about foreign relations of the United States, and 30 years from now, we'll be able to see whether during the Iraq, the two Iraq wars, uh, they discussed it and they weighed it, and they, or they, or it simply wasn't on the table. And my suspicion, I mean, my my claim is that it wasn't on the table. Well, but I think it should make you just a little bit worried that in all the cases when we do have documents, and we can look at, you know, cases where there might have been a practical use. I mean, there are lots of cases when there isn't for practical reasons. Right. Do it. But in all the cases when there seems to have been, there was discussion. And the, uh, so you know, there's the basic problem about. is that these are these are back when the t when according to the, there are documents. It's not like we have no evidence. I mean, Nina has has long chapters on recent cases, but it's it would be nice if we had the inner documents. I mean, I think I think they can, I I don't think it's open and shut that there's a sort of a nuclear taboo. But I think I I buy it. Shelling so, buys it. Um, how do you deal with the issue of how, how we have to agree on what property is worth having? So let me explain um, briefly with the nuclear stuff. Why is having nuclear weapons prestigious considered a good thing? I, uh, presumably, and your analogy with the colonies leads me to believe this is the way you're thinking about it, is because of, it makes you a member of an exclusive club. So like. Only the great powers have colonies. You cannot be a great power unless you have colonies. Therefore, if I come to Germany, I don't care about colonies. I have to acquire some because I need to be a member of this club, right? So presumably, the possession of nuclear weapons makes you makes you part of this exclusive club, and this is public. Right. Obviously, everybody can see it, and it's good. <laughs> and that's why I asked 
when I asked initially, it's like, well, today nuclear, I mean, North Korea has nuclear weapons, but do we really think they're a part of this exclusive club to which the United States and Britain and France and the Russians belong? Yeah. Well, not really, no. They, they really, in, in some sense, the, this prestige factor for them, I don't see it that way, right? And the reason I'm asking also is that, I mean, I started thinking, how do we know over which things to compete? What things are worth to acquire symbols? Like, I was thinking of San Gimignano and the towers. Why were they competing to build the highest towers and not the deepest one, or the fattest one, or the most <laughs> red one, right? No. no, I think that's a good point. I mean, when I say that, that a clear line allows a, an achievement to bear prestige, I'm giving an, uh, what I say is a necessary condition, but I'm not giving uh, other causes and, and, I, and contributing causes. And I would say to find them, to look to the other two elements of the definition of prestige about visibility and about um, desirability. Well, that, that, no, that's not, that's, the other was desirability and power. And so I would say about nuclear weapons, and, and Saddam was fairly articulate about this after he was captured and when he was interviewed by, by CIA interviewers. Uh, it's, it's two things, it's, it's, it's mod modernity. I mean, these are, these are high-tech things and it's uh, the romance of, of you know, Dr. Atomic and how they were found and we've tapped nature and so on. So it's, it's, the, it's the modernity as, modernity as expressed by uh, technological skill. And the other thing is their destructiveness. Maybe you couldn't, maybe Iran, if they got them, wouldn't dare use them. I think that's so. They're not, they're not <coughs> known, except for to, to stop a, an invasion of your territory, they have almost no use, I would say. But still, their destructiveness gives them sim the symbolism of power, and therefore they're the ones, they're the technological achievement that's chosen for prestige. Space programs would be, would be an example of prestige. Absolutely, absolutely, the so called space race. Yeah. Jeff Donkey here, our last question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, st I'm still, still slightly worried about sort of this, um, I mean, we, about, this, about this taboo. I mean, the United States in the 90s did a great deal to try and de-taboo nuclear weapons, the whole doctrine of limited nuclear war, tactical nuclear weapons. Um, if we do have this, um, if we do, um, the thing about a social norm is that it should have observable behavioral consequences, unlike an individual norm. So I'm wondering, how do you separate the assertion that there's a nuclear taboo from the, sim from the alternative hypothesis is that you had an equilibrium, and if somebody broke, somebody used nuclear weapons, they would it would lead to a different, a different equilibrium with you know a nuclear arms race, a multilateral nuclear arms race, which would be a far more less desirable equilibrium. And you could, you know, how would you separate that that explanation from what which is actually sort of norm based? I think you have to go into the details and look at individual leaders and look at what they say. I mean. It's such an open society here where the, um, you know, somebody would say, unlike Israel, the, the, the society is, our, our debates are of what to do are conducted out in the open, amazingly. And so this is what Nina Tannerwall did, and, and I think she's got a pretty good case, although not airtight. I mean, the, absolutely the United States resisted the nuclear taboo because it was in their own interests. But they, um, <coughs> you know, the idea that they had to resist it is, is is evidence. I mean, they, they, why didn't the, the fact that they had to push this against world worries about you're making nuclear weapons more likely to be used and so on? And you could see the you could see the reaction against it after American actions. Okay. Thank All you. Right, uh, thank you very much. Sir. You're welcome. Uh, we'll take a 15 minutes break.